Hi, everyone. We're just waiting a few more minutes, uh, one more minute, perhaps, to let all attendees uh, enter the, the room, and then we'll begin. Okay, I think it's uh, time for us to begin. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for an exciting conversation about the social and political meanings of biometrics and the human tech challenges um, that new identification technologies now entail. My name is Shiri Krebs and I'm an associate professor at Deakin Law School, as well as the co-lead of the law and policy theme of the, uh, at the Government Cybersecurity uh, Cooperative Research Center. Um, I wish to begin by acknowledging that while we are gathered here online, I am joining this event from Deakin University's Burwood campus, which is built on Aboriginal land, and the land uh, particularly of the Bunwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. I would like to pay my respects for the elders, past, present, and emerging, and to extend my recognition to their descendants who are present. So in the following 19 minutes, um, um, we will hear from two experts uh, what they see about what they see as the main challenges that are currently stemming from the growing use of biometrics um, in various social systems and engage in an interdisciplinary discussion about some of the difficulties that arise, particularly from the interaction between humans, machines, technologies in the identification space. And in particular, we will discuss issues concerning biometrics and identity, politics, and the direction of errors in biometric applications, as well as the challenge of protecting privacy in a world of growing surveillance technologies. And I'm very, very glad uh, to say that we have two phenomenal experts to join me in this conversation. Each comes from a different discipline and providing a unique perspective on these new and evolving technologies and challenges. So our first speaker um, will be um, Dr. Pavan Singh, who will provide the social um, um, science perspective of uh, concerning these issues. And Dr. Singh is a visiting fellow at the Australia India Institute, and until recently, a network fellow in contemporary histories at Deakin University. His research examines the right to privacy in India from a legal, technological, and cultural perspective, particularly as these relate to question of social identities, justice, and visibility within datafying systems such as Arahar, the Indian Biometric Identity Project. So Pavan, uh, I invite you to um, start your presentation and share your screen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Sri. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, I'll just start with my presentation. All right, so I'll, I'll be talking about Aadhaar, which uh, in Hindi, uh, which in English means foundation or a basis. Uh, and Aadhaar is India's biometric identity project, which was launched in 2009. And um, it's managed by the unique identification authority of India. I'm just going to give a quick background of Aadhaar before I move on to issues as they pertain to politics of recognition. So Aadhaar is a 12 digit biometric number, uh, which is given to a user on a card once they enroll using their fingertips or iris scans. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, face also with the demographic data, which is your name, your address, uh, and other details uh, at the time of enrollment. Aadhaar was launched with the ostensible view of uh, increasing inclusion of uh, welfare-dependent populations who were seen to be invisible to the state. 
So there was an argument that there's a lot of corruption and middlemen in the delivery of welfare services in India. And we need a more efficient system to uh, cut out uh, identity fraud and uh, you know the siphoning off of benefits which are uh, <clears throat> which are which belong to the welfare beneficiary. Um, it was voluntary at first when it was launched in two thousand nine, uh, but it became mandatory over a period of time starting two thousand fourteen. And uh, this is where the problem begins because not just welfare, uh, uh, the, it, it got linked to a whole lot of other services. Uh, mobile phone users had to, if they wanted to get a SIM, they had to submit their Aadhaar. Bank, banks started asking for Aadhaar and it became more or less, um, you know, it aspired to be a universal identity which cut across all your uh, administrative needs. So it became embroiled in uh, legal challenges, particularly on the question of privacy of Indian citizens. Starting in 2012, a petition filed by a retired High Court judge, Puttaswamy, um, who, uh, who argued that Aadhaar violated Indian citizens' right to privacy. And over a period of six years, that led to a question uh, in not just in the Indian courtrooms, but also uh, in the media about whether privacy is uh, a fundamental right in India and whether Indians have a, a culture of privacy, which could be the basis of such a right. Uh, 2017, Indian Supreme Court declared that privacy is indeed a fundamental right subject to certain limitations, such as national security, and as the government uh, deems fit, uh, but it's valid for uh, welfare. Welfare it, uh, services uh, need to have Aadhaar, mandatory Aadhaar, but not mandatory for other non-welfare services. <clears throat> now, uh, Aadhaar has been pitched as, you know, it's been projected as unique identity because biometrics uh, by definition are unique to an individual. And when we speak of biometrics, it's uh, primarily our fingerprints our fingertips, which are recorded at the time of enrollment. Um, so I'll be talking about the uniqueness of identity, uh, based, a biometric identity, and what kind of the politics of recognition it initiates in when people start authenticating themselves using their biometrics. And I, I want to suggest that we should look at this uniqueness argument within the larger context of the lived context of their implementation. So Aadhaar has been implemented all over India. So we should look at specific case studies where um, individuals have had a lot of issues authenticating themselves. So there are three main considerations. One is administrative, which is related to enrollment requirements at the time of um, you know, applying for an Aadhaar number. The second is human considerations, which includes all kinds of changes from uh, changes to your biometric uh, fingerprints itself, themselves, uh, change, you know, issues of fraud, uh, occupational, <clears throat> excuse me, occupational factors such as manual laborers who, whose fingers have sort of faded because of, you know, heavy physical labor and issues of social power, social relations within the context in which Aadhaar is embedded, the social system. And then there are infrastructural considerations, which include access to IT uh, infrastructures and electricity, which is uh, needed to operate a biometric machine. So this is the broader social and cultural context within which Aadhaar operates. So starting with uh, administrative considerations. One of the most fundamental flawed uh, aspect of Aadhaar is that it's when you enroll for Aadhaar, you have to submit certain identity documents such as your passport, electricity bill, or anything that identifies you as a person. But these are not certified. These are not uh, vetted for in any sense of the word. So in fact, you can you can submit a fraudulent document and enroll in Aadhaar. And 
So, you know, this is a real problem with, this is the base, the whole premise of Aadhaar is based on uncertified, uh, unverified documents. Um, so Anupam Saras, who's a, who's a governance and informatics expert, he argues that identity documents or demographic information uh, submitted during the enrollment often contains errors and they can also be false. And there's no independent audit of the biometric database. So in fact, what, you're, what you have is a whole bunch of biometrics belonging to people who may or may not be who they say, who they, say they are. So it's a case of uh, taking their word for it. And in some cases where they don't have any identity document, documents, there's an introducer system. So say a homeless person lives in a certain society and people know him based on, you know, seeing him daily uh, on the way to work. So they can vouch for him in the, uh, when he or she applies for an Aadhaar. So it's based, so the whole idea of enrolling in this uh, biometric identity scheme is based on uh, previously unverified documents. Um, human considerations, uh, talking about, I talked about fading fingerprints, and these are typically issues that uh, arise uh, in vulnerable populations. This, this includes uh, aging populations whose fingerprints fade as they age, face changes. So facial, uh, facial recognition is another biometric technology that's come into the picture more recently. So changes in the body, physiological changes can uh, create issues of biometric authentication. Disability is another factor when uh, patients with leprosy cannot, are not able to um, authenticate themselves. There's another kind of uh, consideration, which I think is very important, particularly when you, uh, one, a be welfare beneficiary goes and uh, authenticates herself um, is that depending on the social relations of power in, you know, Aadhaar is operating in multiple social cultural contexts. And in a village where there are certain caste hierarchies and class hierarchies, the Russian car de the Russian dealer may not give them rations uh, adequate the quantity they're entitled to. So they may be, their biometric authentication may be successful, but they, they may still not get uh, the what they're entitled to. Um, often uh, it's been found that people have been excluded when their authentication fails, or you know when they have to try repeatedly to authenticate because the first time is unsuccessful. And what they typically do is they use they grease their palms, uh, they use a wet towel to make sure the fingerprints are captured uh, appropriately. Uh, so these are some of the ways in which people have to struggle hard in order to be legible to the state, in order to appear to the state as legitimate beneficiaries of their welfare. Biometrics can also be replicated easily, and there have been cases of fraud where uh, in Haryana, in the state of Haryana, which is in northern India, uh, a biometric operator's biometrics were used uh, in four different places at four different times on the same day while he was at work. So his biometrics were stolen and replicated by someone uh, and used in different parts of the country to authenticate uh, using his identity. So. Uh, I'm happy to go into detail later on, but uh, the problem with biometrics as it pertains to Aadhaar in India is that they can be easily copied and replicated and uh, anyone can you know, use that replicated biometric to authenticate on someone else's behalf. Um, Operating a biometric scanner needs good internet connectivity and which is not the case in India in a lot of uh, semi-urban and rural parts and also uninterrupted supply of electricity. So if the electricity goes, then you're not able to authenticate. And, you know, the government has said, okay, 
make an exception for those times. Uh, maybe they can get an OTP, which is one time password. But then there have been cases where people don't get network coverage on the mobile phone in the village. So they have to climb a tree to literally, uh, you know, hold their phone up to the sky to get the signal. So these factors are also part of the politics of recognition, especially as it relates to Aadhaar and rural parts of India. Uh, I think we should in interrogate this uniqueness because biometrics may be unique, but their operational context suggests otherwise. Um, as I said earlier, uh, Aadhaar is not an, it's been pitched as an identity system but it's not really identifying anyone. It's authenticating people. So anyone who submits certain documents and their biometrics can authenticate themselves uh, subsequently. Um, and that's all it's doing. It's authenticating a person, not identifying them. There is no um, certification of that identity. It's based on unverified documents. So it returns a match if you've submitted, if you've previously enrolled in Aadhaar and you authenticate later on, it'll just uh, identify or authenticate the person to uh, who holds, who submitted those biometrics previously. So it's not successful in eliminating identity fraud. And there's a lot of writing, which I'm happy to talk about later on, uh, on this particular issue. Uh, uniqueness then becomes a very narrow basis for claiming accuracy in identifying persons. And uh, this is uh, evident in a lot of cases of fraud and uh, fraudulent transactions done by uh, certain individuals on behalf of others without their consent. Um, so <clears throat> there are a few cases where Aadhaar data has been used to open bank accounts for people. Uh, actually, one of India's telecom providers, uh, mobile phone service providers, Airtel, they used subscribers' bank accounts to divert their subsidy into those newly opened bank accounts. And they were caught and fined heavily. But that sort of then uh, you know, puts a dampener on the argument around uniqueness. Often we, there's an, another argument about mass surveillance that biometrics can be a tool of mass surveillance. What I found in my research is that uh, most users are happy to submit their biometric data, but they expect that data to be, to have integrity when it's, uh, you know, stored in the database, which means that when they go and authenticate themselves later on for any kind of transaction, uh, it should it should return a match to their authentication attempt. When the authentication attempt fails, that's when the uh, integrity of their data is compromised. So it's actually a compromise of the integrity of recognition. If you fail to uh, if you fail to be recognized by the biometric scanner the first time, uh, and you try multiple times to succeed. Then the next time you go, you'll have the same anxiety that maybe it's not going to work this time again. So integrity of recognition follows uh, media studies scholar Helen Nissenbaum's idea of contextual integrity of information that uh, as far as there is no misuse of information, the integrity of the information is maintained. Um, now, the UIDAI, which manages Aadhaar, which is a unique identification authority of India, uh, has made some claims uh, in the court of law saying that Aadhaar data is very secure. It's, uh, you know, the data is stored in a room uh, which has 13 feet, feet a high wall and five feet, uh, feet thick walls. So they've made these absurd arguments about the security of data in terms of physical infrastructure. But the, the fact is that misrecognition and misuse of biometrics leads to certain kinds of anxieties of recognition for the, not just for the welfare beneficiary, but for other users who are, um, you know, using Aadhaar for mobile phones, banking, taxation. And even though the Indian Supreme Court said 
that you know we you don't need to have Aadhaar for getting a mobile phone connection, a SIM card, or opening a bank account. You know all these uh, parties, all these uh, entities, banks, mobile phone providers. They uh, they insist on Aadhaar. They say they they tell you that it'll be easier if you submit your Aadhaar, even though it's not mandatory. So a person has no choice but submit because they have an Aadhaar card. Uh, they don't mind parting with that data because it's easier, even though it's not mandatory. Um, yeah, so I think that's where I'll end. And uh, I hope I'm in good time. And I look forward to listening to uh, Rajesh and then uh, questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Pavan. This was really um, illuminating. Um, so we'll move now to our second speaker and then we'll open up for Q&A and discussion uh, because the, the, the real purpose of this conversation is to have um, an integration between um, uh, the, the social science and the technology aspects of, of this problem. So uh, we shall now hear from Professor Raj Vasa, who leads the transla translational research at the Applied Artificial Intelligence Institute at Deakin. He's an uh, innovator and entrepreneur with over two decades of experience spanning both industry and academia with a specialization in artificial intelligence and complex software systems design. So we're very lucky to uh, have Raj join us today. Um, you're now welcome to join us and start your presentation, Raj. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, very interesting, uh, Pavan. Um, so I'll, I'll take the, of course, the technologist's viewpoint of it, but I've done my best to acknowledge and try and pitch it to explain myself why some of these things happen. Uh, rather than much more, uh, rather than say they don't happen, and et cetera. So this, I'll just start with um, what biometrics is. So typically biometrics uh, are considered to be uh, measures we can extract from a human. So fingerprints, face, which comes from an image or gait. So we can uh, take a video and we can extract a, a fingerprint or a print of someone gate print of someone based on how they walk. Uh, we can um, do iris scans as well. And uh, both face and gait can be captured without consent quite easily uh, because technology allows us to scale that. Um, and most AI models can detect these days uh, both faces and gates and fingerprints. Not perfect, but they're very, very good. Um, very, very good budget. So privacy itself uh, is the next topic. Um, generally speaking, digital data is extremely easy to collect, uh, but typically it's best to treat all data as toxic. And that's something that's only emerged in the last three to five years inside the technology people, where um, previously the general rule of thumb was collect everything. Uh, there's now a hesitancy to collect, collect everything. In fact, collect only what you need and that to keep it for as little time frame as possible. Not widespread, but that is a acknowledgement and that would take some time. Data has a shelf life. Um, so data from five years ago may not be as relevant. And the reason is that it makes sense in context. So when the context of the world changes, that particular data we collected may no longer be as meaningful. And almost all of the privacy issues we have are typically because of uh, bad actors. The bad actors expose poor design choices. So I'll explain why that happens through some simple observations next. So technology itself scales humans. Because humans are involved, it ends up being a socio-technical problem. So the word technology scales humans is the most important terminology, a term I should talk about primarily because when I say humans, it's it scales the good humans as well as the bad actors. So technology speeds up people that want to do evil actually. Um, and 
the only response we have is we have to be intelligent and compassionate. And I've used the word compassionate as a summarization of the politics of recognition. Um, may not be the most precise formation of it. I'm not from humanities. I had to actually Google up what politics of recognition was. And that was the closest word I could come up with. And with intelligence and compassion, we can influence the consequences. Apologize for the background. It should be white. For some reason, it's come red in Zoom. Um, so the key observations about technology where I'll try and bring everything together is so if you notice uh, technology, it's probably broken. And I'll explain why I mean that. Um, either a tech piece of technology is adopted and it can be adopted by force, uh, like we can get it through regulation or it is adopted because it's popular or it dies. So almost anything we notice in technology, the broken bits uh, is because of survivorship bias. So we only notice the stuff that's being widely used and not working to expectation. The third thing is quality has to be designed into a technology. Uh, it's extraordinarily hard to test quality into a system and fix it post hoc. Um, software is just not designed like that. Um, technology is not designed like that. It doesn't like to be fixed post hoc well, especially around quality. So either it's got it, and if it doesn't have it at inception, it means it's very, very difficult. Uh, failure is a first class citizen in technology. So almost all technology will fail. We just don't know when and how badly it'll fail. Robustness matters to users. So if you bring all these things together, and if they look contradictory, counterintuitive, full of paradoxes, it is. So technology has these built-in paradoxes and conflicts. Many of many of them are very hard to resolve uh, because some of the things like uh, Pavan was highlighting is uh, the fingerprint uh, being faded out for someone who works um, in a field it is a failure in operation. Now, when they designed for it, unless the engineers were told that particular piece of quality attribute must be there, they won't design for it. And hence it'll fail. And the minute it fails, you notice it because it's broken. So a piece of technology that's working really well, you won't notice it. So that's, that's the beauty of technology. Uh, we don't notice the car we drive um, beyond the first week maybe uh, because it's doing its job. Um, similarly, if you use your phone and you notice it, it's probably not connected or internet's gone down or something's gone down with it. So those, those, those things exist. So with this uh, failure, the faded, faded finger, fingerprint, my suspicion was, would be that the engineers were never told this. Now, if the engineers were not told, you could say they weren't, they told everyone should have known, is the general explanation would be is they don't know or someone actively deprioritized it. They may have known for it. The thing is, if you plan for failure too much, you never ship it. So to get a timeline, we would optimize it and say, well, we know that this is broken. So every piece of software ships with lots and lots of known issues. Um, engineers know about it, they just haven't gotten around to fixing it. So, oh, there you go, now I know. I've obviously changed the background somehow. So, uh, the quality itself is, is very, very hard aspect. So engineers struggle to test for qualitative descriptions. So if you said, I need a system that must be respectful or must attribute fairness and must preserve privacy, unless they, these can be made mathematically, engineers cannot give any guarantees. So back to the robustness argument. Um, What are we gonna do about it? So generally speaking, most of the AI side, I'm just bringing in a, a general rule of thumb here with machine learning and stuff is that machine learning algorithms, most of the focus has always been on uh, testing for that part of it. But what we are shifting to is starting to ask these questions by saying, what data did we learn from? What did the machine learn? Uh, is this useful? Did we make the right assumptions about it? But the same thing applies even if you didn't have a machine learning algorithm, even if you had a normal algorithm, 
these are things that have only recently started to be prominent in uh, the technology field. So traditionally, these things never made much sense for engineers to consider because they default assumed the world really good, or at least that's what I think it is the reason why they didn't. They're not malicious. It's just that they're ignorant and they probably assume that more, they didn't design for the bad actors. And again, if you start saying, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, you come across uh, in a development team as someone who's very negative and they'll say, you'll never ship it at the, at the amount of constraints you have to consider. The other reason why we don't necessarily constrain or design for failure is we don't know all the aspirations that we should have when we start the design process. Some of these are discovered quite late in the design process and those trade-offs are very hard to reconcile um, due to lack of budget or because we made other choices that don't gel well. So some variation of this is what's happening. Um, now, what can we do about it is, well, I would probably just say there's always version N plus one and we have to continuously keep uh, improving it. Much like, I guess, the law of the lands are made is uh, when we have a broken law, we go fix it. Or when we discover that something's not working, we have to go and fix it. Um, there's not many easy solutions. And this is not something AI or any technology itself can fix. So that's been, uh, hopefully that's been a, a different perspective. And I tried to keep it really short and summarized. So, and uh, I'll uh, go back to the key points, uh, which one more time, just uh, those ones that, uh, uh, the paradoxes and uh, conflicts and uh, we'll end it at that and open for questions. Thank you very much Raj, this was really fascinating. Um, so I want to thank both of you for your presentations and now it is indeed time for us to um, start the, um, the conversation part of today's session. So I will start with a couple of Questions. And while I do that, I um, strongly and warmly invite all our uh, panelists and attendees to put some questions in the um, in the chat, and I will invite you to ask your questions in a couple of minutes. Um, so just to start the discussion off, um, I um, so I, I've I've talked to um, both of you before, and, and I had a couple of questions in mind, but something that really stood up for me now, uh, listening to both your presentations, um, was the issue of identity. So we talked a little bit about, you mentioned, both of you mentioned some of the privacy challenges and the way that um, new technologies um, struggle with, with some of, you know, um, um, data security and, and our right to privacy. But I would like to hear a little more from both of you on the way that, um, AI algorithms, new identification technologies affect our identity and perhaps even construct um, how we feel about our own identity, how perhaps technology is part of the way that we recognize ourselves. And we can think about this, not just with uh, kind of biometrics that the government hold, but even when we you know, want to open our phones. Um, so is this now, uh, a new kind of human machine aspect that becomes a part of who we are. And I, I think it would be really interesting to hear um, your responses from both aspects, from, from the more kind of uh, recognition and, uh, and, and identity part, but also Raj from your more kind of technical um, perspective of these issues. So um, whoever wants to start. Um, I'm happy to start. Um, thanks Raj. The default engineering answer would be that this is not an engineering problem per se. Uh, because yes, they have a huge influence. And like I said, we have to be intelligent and compassionate. Beyond that, it's extremely hard to do much about it, especially because when we build a piece of software or any technology, we don't know the social consequences fully. Uh, we have some imagination of it, uh, but, but we, we generally don't know. And we're not taught that extremely well, nor do we have the appropriate training to consider it. Um, so we don't. Um, so beyond working with someone, uh, I mean, Leonard's a rare one. Um, um, he, he actually spent time about all this and thought about it a lot more, but technologists that take the human angle are few and far between. So beyond collaborations uh, with uh, the humanities side, it's very difficult to do much else. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree, of course, with that point. But I was just thinking because there is some technology aspect into deciding who we are, 
right? So you need, as an engineer, you have to think about, okay, so how many data points I need to make a match? How many, you know, what is the direction of errors? How, and at some point, some of that becomes, you know, I, I'm just wondering in that spectrum between how we conceptualize who we are and the technology that says, this is who you are, um, the, is there any aspect, yeah? Not really, we would design it purely as a statistical property. So there is some statistical number that I have to hit and I'm optimizing for that. I'm not really considering the, the human consequences of that choice. And how that statistical determination is, you know, is it just an arbitrary number? No, or? It's, it's like, what's the most number of humans I can identify accurately uh, with the least amount of error in a certain time frame? So I have to do it in, in few milliseconds on a chip of this size without using too much data, et cetera, et cetera. So it's given all that, it's, it's, a math, it's a set of mathematical optimizations that are happening. And inside that, there's no optimization for the consequence on the human aspect of it, because it's not quantifiable in a, any empirical sense. And it's difficult. So you just ignore it. Uh, <laughs> and you, um, I mean, that's what happens. We, we don't necessarily attribute it. And if you do say you must consider it, most engineers would naturally say, okay, give me a number. How do I optimize for it? How do I know that it is good or bad? And there, it's a hard answer. So the choices are made on let's ship it and figure it out. Um, and the thing with technology is because it scales and it goes fast, the finding out part um, may be too far. I mean, we may have caused a lot of damage in that process. So the solution would be to where such high impact may happen. Again, we don't know if it will. If we can anticipate it, we probably shouldn't ship it. Um, so things like we wouldn't do this when we're building a nuclear reactor. We would be super careful because we know quite clearly the consequences and uh, human health harm it causes. Whereas this one is, is not quite not fully understood uh, and hence it's not being considered. That's my belief is how, why it doesn't get considered. No, this is really interesting. Thank you so much for that. And, and perhaps, uh, Pavan, would you like to uh, respond um, to that issue from, from your perspective and research? Oh, sure, certainly. Um, I think I agree with Raj uh, regarding the difficulty in uh, grappling with the qualitative aspect of designing technology. How do you anticipate certain issues? Because you're designing for the human, not for a social identity per se. You're designing for a you know, population, not particularly keeping in mind who, what aspect of themselves they prioritize uh, in interacting with the technology. So that's one thing. Um, it's hard for me to talk about algorithms and AI because I still haven't quite um, you know, researched uh, those subjects in any great detail beyond what's been said about them, that you know, they discriminate, they're often based on biased data. Uh, they're designed such that to reproduce uh, certain kinds of prejudices uh, and technology learns from uh, technology is as good as the data you uh, feed it, at least algorithms. But uh, I'd like to uh, think a little bit more counterintuitively and a little bit controversially about uh, this whole idea of mass surveillance, that technology is a tool of mass surveillance. Um, I think one uh, thing we I'd like people to recognize is that there is, and this has been discussed by a lot of scholars, that there's an innate need for visibility and appropriate recognition by technology as much as there's a need for data privacy, which probably happens later on when you know our honeymoon with the technology is kind of over. And then we realize, oh shit, what have I done? Um, having said that, <clears throat> um, in the implementation of technology, I think there's certain steps that can be taken. The problem with Aadhaar arose when it became mandatory, that you have to have Aadhaar in order to be able to access these services in India. And no alternative, you had all these paper identities before, which were considered 
flawed, but they were working. But when Aadhaar came in, it was taken as a complete replacement of those paper identities for at least a certain period of time. And even now, uh, you know, when uh, it's more of a nudge and more of a, we encourage you to submit your Aadhaar because it'll get done quicker rather than using. So I cannot speak about, you know, what kind of security and privacy problems arise with Aadhaar. There are clearly problems as, as has been documented by uh, privacy activists and you know, research think tanks like Internet Freedom Foundation in India. But I think we need to um, have a more nuanced view of the narrative of mass surveillance because uh, people, especially welfare beneficiaries in India who don't have a choice but link their Aadhaar data to uh, the database of the, the welfare service uh, have to have no expectation of privacy. They, they cannot uh, you know, expect to have control over their data because they're mandatory, mandatorily required by law to submit their biometrics. So, I think for them, privacy is more a matter of dignity. You know, when they go and authenticate, it should be, it should match their authentication attempt and they should get their ration without there being too much of a fuss. Because just imagine, a, you know, a, a transaction where a person is trying to authenticate repeatedly and holding up the line. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's, it's about human dignity in that moment. So I'll leave it at that without going on and on. But uh, I think we need to think about privacy from different aspects. You know, dignity is a fundamental aspect which is integral to our recognition. Uh, and as long as our dignity, which uh, is linked to the data we uh, submitted with the government uh, is preserved, uh, I think privacy then is preserved. So privacy need to be thought beyond the data aspect and, you know, looked into other kinds of formulations. Thank you. Thanks, um, Pavan. This was really um, interesting. So um, I see we have several questions, both from the panel and attendees. So I'll open up now for, for the questions and then I'll continue with a few other burning issues that I uh, wanted to ask you both. So we can start with um, Jeffrey Craig. Would you like to ask your question, Jeff? Yeah, um, I can't put my video on, but it doesn't matter. Um, I, um, my question, Oh, there you go, start my video. Um, I have a kind of flippant question and then a main one. The flippant question is, about, um, I think Raj was saying you can only see it, see it if it's broken. That kind of implies that there are covert systems out there that work perfectly that no one knows about. Um, my, my main question is, um, what about the, if, it's, if you're talking about facial recognition or, or gate recognition, then there's a sizable proportion of society with um, that have disabilities, uh, physical disabilities. Um, and um, there are, in some countries, maybe specific ethnicities. I'm thinking of say like the Uyghurs in China who may have a, be able to, who a system may be designed to um, identify as a subpopulation. So can anyone talk to that, those issues of, the proportion of the population that is um, either designed to include or exclude? Uh, if this and the first question you had uh, uh, close in some ways um, is that it will fail that piece of technology uh, if it encounters a, a, a face or a gate pattern that it has not seen in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, the machine would say, I don't recognize this or it'll misrecognize it. Can it happen? Absolutely. Uh, it can happen and it does happen. It will happen. Um, like I said, failure is always a first class citizen in technology. It will happen. The issue is how do you deal with that failure? Sometimes we have a manual process and sometimes we may not consider it and just ignore it. And that's where the compassion side comes in. 
Um, the, either we choose to build such technology, in which case we need to be compassionate at failure time and be acknowledgement, acknowledge it, or um, we can be malicious and use it for mass surveillance. That, that base technology, unfortunately, can scale beautifully to bad actors. Um, so there's some, an entire group of researchers now actively avoiding facial recognition and technology in that case. They're no longer working in that field. They're, they're walking away from it and saying, we no, will no longer do that type of research. Um, but it's probably way too late, I'd say. So the, the techniques have been shown to work. And the irony is the technique is designed in the 80s. It just so happened that the computers are fast enough and cheap enough now for us to do it. Um, so it's, it's again, yeah, not, not much we can do except by saying we have to regulate it back into, into some shape that is manageable. Very important comments. Thanks, Raj. Uh, Pavan, did you have any response to, to the question or? Don't, don't feel pressured. We can move on to the next one. Yeah, let's just move on because uh, I don't know so much about the, you know, technological aspect of, uh, but, you know, I have things to say about um, designing a technology, which is just, you, you've heard me say that before, so I'll, uh, I'll wait for the next question. Um, so I think the next question is from our um, attendees. So the problem is that I can't see the name of who's posting it. So the first name that I can see is from Margarita Vladimirova. Uh, so Margarita, if you can um, unmute yourself, you can simply ask uh, your question. Oh, great. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Shiri. Uh, thank you both very much for the presentation. That's a fascinating topic. And I'm very glad to see Rajesh again. Um, so I do have a question for both of the presenters because you did talk about the biometrics. And I was wondering, would you say that facial information is somehow different from other types of biometrics in terms of personal relation to that and also in terms of data collection storage because we do know that if you do need to collect fingerprints, for example, or retina scan, you need to be very close to the person. They actually have to be aware of what is happening, whether if there will be any facial data collection, it can happen even without the person's consent. So again, there can be different um, variables related to that um, condition. So I was wondering what is your position on that. And uh, one more question for Mr. Pawan, because you did talk about some of the biometrics that were stolen in the North India, and I was wondering what kind of biometrics was it? Thank you. Um, so I can take the first one, uh, which is facial data. Um, in terms of actual face print, it's, it's a, a set of numbers, about 256 numbers. There's different ways of doing it, but there's a, there's a bunch of numbers that every human becomes. Very easy to collect from a distance if you have high quality cameras. Um, so not the cheap cameras, a high quality camera. Lighting of your face matters a lot. So if it's well lit, evenly lit, the recognition accuracy is very high. If it's poorly lit, then recognition accuracy is much lower. The technology coming out of China claims it can be it can bypass some of those limitations, but um, I'm not so sure how they've done it. But that's what they claim that they can do it. Um, so they're saying take okay, low resolution images with poor lighting and still can recognize. Um, same for gate. Gate actually doesn't require very high resolution imagery. It can detect and identify um, people with, with even low resolution imagery because it's going on a video feed, which is movement of data. Whereas face requires a, a photograph, uh, typically speaking. So, and yeah, of course it's because it's easy to collect, it's easy to deploy and almost likely all mass surveillance uh, kind of technologies would use facial recognition and gate recognition. Uh, moving forward. Gate will be maybe five years out, 
from mass use, but it will be used in the next five years. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, one problem is with facial recognition is that uh, is it uh, is it doing it live or it's an authentication happening? If, you know, in the moment, or is someone using a photograph of a person? To, because this was a problem with Aadhaar, at least when they use facial recognition. Uh, you know, they, there was a security issue with people using photographs of the person to authenticate. Uh, and you could, you know, there was no requirement of the person being uh, authenticated in a live uh, setting. So they, they needn't be present. Um, but their photograph could be used to, uh, so it, it poses certain privacy risks in India. And the other factor is, of course, uh, physiological, biological changes in the face. If you have uh, an injury or disfiguration, all those things. And specifically, I see a question about transgender identities. So facial recognition, how does that, I mean, I haven't done much research on that, but that's a valid question. How would a transgender person be recorded? Uh, because, and this is a separate question again about transgender identity. Does trans mean you're uh, always in transition or is it, you know, once, is, is there a point where you can say I've, I've transitioned and this is my identity? So transgender identity is again, given the fluidity, the emphasis on fluidity of gender and sexual identities, not so much sexual, but gender, because there's a visible change in if you go for the surgery. Um, so this, how does this idea of identities, fluidity, as it reflects in your physical identity, interact with technologies such as facial recognition, which seek to fix, um, you know, authentication, tether authentication to a fixed uh, parameter like the face. So that's one question to think about in terms of, uh, you know, the fluidity, not just of gender identities, but perhaps other kinds of issues like uh, disability, medical conditions, which can happen over time. So uh, I guess that would be a question of for how technology is designed uh, to keep up with those uh, dynamic transformations of social identity, which are again reflected in the physical body in certain specific ways. What was the other I see a question about uh, transgender and disability. So I, I hope I've addressed that in some sense. But uh, the problem with these, these identity categories are again sensitive identities, at least in the Indian society and as elsewhere to a certain extent, uh, because transgender identity, as much as it's about gender, it's also, there's also a medical aspect to a transgender person's life. So if they are transitioning medically, then it also includes medical data, which is again a very sensitive category according to the data protection bill, which is still not enforced in India, is still in the consultation stage. Um, sim similar with disability, again, you know, disability, can, it needn't always be a visual disability, it needn't be uh, a bodily impairment. It can, you know, be an invisible. How do you visualize HIV on a person, right? So there is a real paradox here in becoming visible to the state to access benefits. Uh, for example, uh, getting antiretroviral therapy for your HIV condition. Uh, and there was, in fact, a proposal to link Aadhaar to uh, the medical records of HIV positive people who were availing of those benefits, but in their respective contexts. Uh, so imagine a small town in India where this is happening, where an HIV positive person is going to authenticate using Aadhaar to avail of their uh, <clears throat> antiretroviral drugs and the operator gets to know them 
that they are and they live next door in the in the, or close by in the same neighborhood so you know the again going back to what raj mentioned you know bad actors you know humans are you know it's not in good faith so uh these systems end up exposing uh humans to uh, at least as far as sensitive data is concerned medical data data pertaining to gender and sexual orientation uh disability uh and many other categories which become sensitive uh when they're data fight so datafication of identities uh has you know produces this real paradox of visibility you have to be visible to the state in order to uh be helped by the state but at the same time you're not interacting with the state as such you're interacting with an agent of the state who's a human so um I guess there's no resolution. It's just uh, you know there, we can think of coping mechanisms when such things happen. But uh, yeah, if there are other questions, I'm you know happy to talk more about these uh, paradoxes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for these uh, very comprehensive answers. So we have now two additional questions from uh, the panelists. And the first one is from um, Tao Pan, and the second would uh, be Radhika. So we'll, uh, we'll start with Tao. Uh, quickly, I just want to answer Margarita's question. Sorry, I forgot. I okay. sent her a link uh, on, on the chat. But the biometrics that were stolen were fingerprints. So they were fingerprints can be stored digitally uh, on computer and they can be stolen and reproduced. So the question, one question, I guess Raj can speak more to it is about liveness. Are you, is a fingerprint that's been, uh, you know, tested against a biometric scanner, is, is that a live fingerprint or is that a copy? Um, so that's, uh, that's where uh, UIDI, which is the authority that manages Aadhaar, didn't know about this. And I think they fixed it later on, but uh, other kinds of problems uh, arise in, as Aadhaar is being used wi widely in India. Uh, Thanks, Pavan. Some sensors can measure blood flow. So, but typically most, yeah, you could easily fake one. Thanks, Raj. Um, Tao, would you like to ask your question now? Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you both of you so much. Um, so interesting so far. Um, I'm really interested in what Pavan was saying around uh, that this is a technology of authenticity or of authenticating rather than identification. Um, and I was particularly interested in what you mentioned about the kind of techniques of legibility, where you were saying uh, people using towels, did you say, to, to bring the fingerprints up? I wonder if you could expand on that a bit more and maybe share some other techniques of legibility that people, people are using. Because often when we hear about stories of recognition and misrecognition, it's people trying to evade the state or people using masks, for instance, or in Hong Kong when they were using lasers to try and evade, evade surveillance. But here we have, as you say, a different, uh, a different scenario where people are, are desperately trying to become legible to the state. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> That's a very valid and legitimate point about uh, the need to be the strategic or uh, the strategy behind the need to be visible to the state. Um, so these people who are welfare beneficiaries have no choice but be legible if they want to get their benefits from the state. They have to uh, they have to go to the authentication center, which may be miles away. So this is another paradox, which is usually not talked about uh, in the discourse much, is the fact that Aadhaar centers are located in particular locations and, will, and they may be far from the Indian village where the beneficiary lives. So Aadhaar promises improved social mobility by giving people benefits. But then it compels physical mobility. Uh, and especially if you're disabled, you're poor, you don't have a means of transportation. Uh, it compels physical travel to the center. 
in order to present yourself and authenticate. Um, yeah, and there, there have been cases where manual laborers, their fingerprints don't get captured easily. And I'm not sure how they do it with uh, towels. Sometimes they use Vaseline to grease the palm to make sure the texture of the skin softens up and they're able to, but I don't know to what extent they are successful. But a lot of these um, scenarios have been documented on video. And my presentation had a resources page. There's, I'll, I'll type it here later on. It, the website is Rethink Aadhaar, and they have a document, video documentation of a lot of these um, case studies where people have gone to authenticate and on camera, you know, they're failing to authenticate. And I, for me, that's a very anxiety ridden moment, you know, which turns the lens back onto your identity and you think there's something wrong with me that I cannot, it's not the technology, but it's my fault that I'm not able to, you know, uh, authenticate you to get my benefits. Mm. So that's, uh, that's one. The other is this idea of, you know, trying to catch the network in a village, uh, you know. So sometimes they take the biometric machine outside the shop to get a better signal from, you know, because it's all interconnected to uh, the network, the biometric scanner is interconnected, is connected to the database, which is a central identities, uh, identities repository, CIDR, which is a repository of biometric data. So it has to ping there for it to be a positive match on the send. So sometimes they have to physically, you know, take the machine and go to different spots nearby in order to uh, in order to be able to catch the signal on the machine. I, and then they said, okay, let's just do one-time passwords, which were, which is popularly called OTP. Um, but again, the issue is of a signal and how many people own mobile phones. And it also presumes digital literacy in you know people who are trying to access these benefits so what i've found in my work is in my research is that uh, most people it's often said that indians or people don't care about privacy you know that's a very flippant way of saying it i think most people care about privacy but what kind of privacy they care about is not necessarily data privacy you know data is already out there we can't do much about it the least we can expect is uh, the integrity of that information to be preserved. Uh, because if that's compromised, then uh, my identity is compromised. And again, that may happen rarely or infrequently, but um, I think privacy is a learning exercise. You know, We learn about how privacy can be violated in different ways as time goes, and there is no law or technology that can safeguard privacy. I think as long as hum it's, the context is human society, it's very hard to say that uh, a law or a technology can. Uh, there is, the, there are of course, different frameworks, principles like privacy by design, uh, which inform the designing of technologies. But, you know, we live in a world of Cambridge Analytica and many other data breaches. So I think it's time we shifted our expectations from this discourse of mass surveillance to something more nuanced, which takes into account our needs for recognition as well as, you know, uh, integrity of that recognition. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that flippant attitude that you pointed out just then um, is really important to acknowledge because each of us who works at a university would understand that we all use authentication software every time we try to log into our own accounts and it's not it's really not a choice <laughs> for many of us we either have access to our emails or we don't it's a it's a matter of employment um, um, and as you say the kind of anxiety that produces I mean I think everybody here would have had a moment where they're desperately trying to prove that they are who they are to the machine they are who they are to access their emails or or to access their medicare or anything like that um, and when you feel this profound sort of, I don't even know 
I can't even answer these things correctly. Yeah. Thank you. I think I, anxiety is a legitimate privacy interest, which is often not recognized. And maybe, I don't know if this is such a wild idea, but if we can design technology, technologies uh, trying to take into account the anxieties it's going to induce in a person, that would be, you know, and sort of mitigate that, that would be something. But I don't know if I'm way off in my thinking of how technologies are designed. I actually, I have to interject, uh, even though I, I know Radhika is next, because uh, one of my questions for both of you was, both of you mentioned different aspects of um, compassion and technology, and uh, especially Raj, and, you know, uh, you know coming from uh, the engineer in the room, I, I thought, you know, it, it may be worth to say another thing about, um, you know, how we deal with, you know, how can identification technologies um, be compassionate? Um, is this really about engineers who design uh, the systems need to, you know, think about the humans, the stress that they may feel, how it affects, you know, how we feel about ourselves and the stress, you know, operating the technologies. So I think maybe, and, and Radhika, forgive me, but maybe another uh, minute or two to just kind of uh, unpack this issue of compassion um, within identification technologies. So when we design for it, we uh, try and account for emotional reactions um, early on in workshops. We do ask for it, but it's really hard to test except subjectively. And often at scale, we don't know the full impact uh, because the flow on effects are only discovered in operation, uh, not necessarily in a lab like setting. And often people don't ask, like, for example, there's a recent project we did where we designed, uh, we made some things optimal in a hospital setting in Australia. And we, we thought we did a great job. The optimization actually, um, there were two groups um, and we improved the handover in, in between paramedics and nurses in the hospital, for example. And we thought it was a great job. And we asked them, they said all the right things. In practice, what happened is that uh, the speed at which the handover happened caused more anxiety in an otherwise manual process. And in fact, the nurses said they wanted the manual process after we implemented the automation because that's where they went to relax. So they, they looked forward to the three hours when they could manually do the work instead of being in a high stress environment. It's hard to know that ahead of time. Uh, it's not necessarily privacy related, but it, there's points like that that we don't know when we start our design process. And the users may not know the consequences because they've never used the technology themselves. Um, so at scale, things like Aadhaar, I'm sure many people would have found it to be compelling. Um, there, I'm sure there are people who would have said there are going to be issues we should consider it uh, at the same time. Uh, but typically the way it all works and politics works and organizations work is if it looks like it solves the problem uh, they might just say let's do it um, and then let's deal with the consequences and they happen uh, not all of the leaders are like that but but most many of them quite are like that so yeah so it's not easy to resolve we can try we do try and we have methods for it but they're all kind of sort of moving in the right direction but not quite finished and this is fascinating. Thank you so much for, for that input, Raj. Um, Pavan, did you want to add anything about, um, you know, your, your proposal for a more compassionate uh, recognition technologies? Uh, yeah, I think um, one, as much as technology is a wonderful thing, uh, it should not occupy a central place in our lives. Uh, it should not mediate all the processes, uh, but the way the world is evolving, developing, um, technology is coming to play a greater role. But reliance on technologies, I think the you know extreme reliance, like what happened with Aadhaar, it was forced down people's throats and people had to have Aadhaar uh, in order to be a citizen, even though it doesn't grant citizenship, but in for all practical purposes, you know, to be legible to the state, to, to be able to, and, you know, for 
the problem is we can all have issues with the technology about privacy, about its functionality, but we have to recognize that technology operates at a much larger scale for people who may not have those issues, who may not have data privacy issues, who may be like, yeah, I'll just do it, you know, get, so privacy is a very time consuming discourse in a way, you know, it's all, we are often told, and I'm going slightly off the question about anxieties, but we often told that we should take care of our privacy. We should, you know, change our settings, change our passwords. But I found in my, you know, anecdotal evidence and I've seen people, privacy, you know, induces a lot of passionate speech. We are all willing to defend it, but not willing to protect it when it comes to our own, you know, we. So data sharing is inevitable. And uh, as far as the question of anxiety is concerned, that's one I, I, I grapple with uh, pretty much uh, reg regularly, not just by research, but also by using different kinds of technologies. What is happening to my identity? Uh, now I worry about posting on Twitter, uh, you know, any critique of the Indian government because, you know, it, it, can, it can come back to you in some way or the other. So stress, te technological stress, I think needs to be studied. There's, I'm sure there are studies about technological fatigue and stress, but this question of anxiety, privacy, the loss of privacy, the loss of identity as an anxiety needs to be probed further. And there's a wonderful scholar in the US, I think he's at Stanford, Ryan Kahlo, who's a legal scholar uh, who works on this question of subjective harm, privacy harms, uh, which need to be recognized in relation to uh, information technologies. So I don't have much to say on the design aspect uh, as, far as, the, as far as the nuts and bolts of designing technologies is concerned. But I think what this shows is uh, precise, what it uh, reinforces is uh, precisely the need of why this panel was, you know, put together to bring in different disciplinary perspectives, uh, you know, pitch, put social sciences together with uh, technologists, people who design technologies and have them have conversations and talk to each other. And I think that's where things like empathy and compassion, we need more qualitative research uh, in the field of uh, IT information technologies. I think without that, um, the same thing will continue to happen. Thank you so much, Pavan. So um, now I know, Radhika, you said that I basically asked um, your question. Sorry about that. But um, when I look at the at the chat, I, I can see a few other questions from you there. And uh, one of them in particular, I, I find fascinating about, you know, this perhaps intersection between compassion, identity and technology. So uh, would you like uh, to still ask your question, Radhika? Um, yes, I would. Thank you, Shiri. Um, I was thinking, um, I, was, I was struck by, you know, Raj mentioned compassion almost in the passing in, in the first, uh, you know, iteration during his presentation. Uh, I guess I can turn my video on as well. Okay. Um, and um, in the morning, we had another session on, on the anthropos and uh, we discussed their care, you know, care as a, as a way to operate in the world. Um, and I was thinking, you know, kind of trying to think together with compassion and care and so on. Um, and again, uh, Pawan actually uh, touched on that uh, just now, thinking about, so what do we do? I mean, I can see that obviously, uh, you know, there's on the one hand, all these technologies allow people to be recognized, to access care, to access um, welfare and so on. So, but on the other hand, there are, you know, uh, possible harms. Um, and I think if we say, you know, Pawan, you mentioned research is necessary. I think there's in fact a fair amount of research or at least, you know, uh, emerging research in this area. But I was thinking about, you know, uh, and Raj and I have often had these conversations and Raj says, well, you know, the client briefs us and we produce what the client wants. 
And if it works, then that then that's a successful technology. If it works as the client wants it to work, um, and I feel that more and more, I know that I'm every time I use the IT services in the university, they ask me if I'm happy. You know, so there's there is a way that they're concerned about the users, you know, comfort or users happiness. Uh, although I find that those surveys are in fact even more annoying, you know, than, than the struggle that led me to seek that service to start with. So I'm just wondering about a, you know, how do actually what should what can we do uh, in terms of actually um, having these? Is it possible to have interdisciplinary teams designing these things to start with? Uh, I know that when you're commercially produ producing a commercial product, you would do a lot to test it with, you know, users. Um, and I think now it's like you put it into use and then you test, you kind of get the feedback from the users. Maybe there's a step missing before that, before actually sending it out. And I was wondering also about, um, yeah, so it's so, so kind of working together to, to do that. And also wondering about briefing the client clients themselves, you know, to what extent do we have a responsibility or does do IT um, or AI uh, professionals or people are designing these products. Uh, to what extent is there an obligation that they actually also brief the client about the possible kind of, um, how, you know, not just to produce what they want, but to educate them on what they ought to want or what, what might be the possible kind of um, misuses, not from, a, not from their legal or, you know, uh, liability point of view, but actually from the users, uh, protecting the user point of view. Um, we have a subfield called affective computing, which considers the emotional goals of a user, uh, which are done early in the life cycle. We, we do ask, where possible, we consider it. Um, the difficulty is we don't know if we've achieved those affective goals uh, or, or emotional goals. We, we can say we think we've addressed it, but we don't really know because a lot of those things are only discovered in testing at scale. Um, and at scale, the effects are very different and consequences are very different and the ripples are very different. Um, so Twitter, when it first started and Facebook, when they first started, would not have imagined where, what they're getting used for um, because they've given loudspeaker and, and I'm pretty confident they didn't start out by saying Donald Trump one day would use it to get uh, elected to be president. It played a huge role in his election. And that was not a, a goal, design goal at any time in Twitter's uh, engineering discussions, I suspect. Uh, and, and that's the difficulty. Some of those tools will get used in unexpected ways. The other thing is the anxiety may be induced in unanticipated ways. So people that designed the identity system would have designed it with reasonably good intent in mind. They're not malicious, all the engineers I know. They may not be fully knowledgeable about humanities, but they're not trying to do evil things. So, but it, yes, yeah, so those things we can, we, ha, we can do some things better and we do try to do some things better, but it's very difficult to know till the consequences happened, how to regulate it sometimes. I was, I was actually wondering about, you know, um, interdisciplinary work. Uh, it's not as though the humanities has all the answers either. I think, in fact, it's probably better at, at raising some questions or raising awareness of certain things or whatever. But I was just wondering, because we do talk, I mean, talking about interdisciplinarity has been, you know, a long, uh, there's been a long tradition of that, but it's been quite not as easy to do. So we're still trying to encourage that. We still need, we still need to try to encourage that because it's not happening as much as it might. Uh, and it seems as though sometimes people speak quite different languages and it's, it's hard to do. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, to what extent we might, I know increasingly, for example, ethicists are engaged by, you know, um, and I think Shiri, you would know that this is probably more to do with liability uh, perhaps than, than uh, you know, other, other considerations. But I was just wondering about ways in which we could, you know, uh, kind of design it even more. Um, through the process of uh, interdisciplinary kind of collaboration. And it, we should try, at a minimum, we should try on the next project we, we encountered, we should try and collaborate. Uh, at a, because we might learn more on how to solve some of these problems. Well, so. perfect. We already have a half a solution. <laughs> um, so I think we only have uh, time for one last 
question. And we have a question here from um, uh, Christopher O'Neill. So Christopher, would you like to um, um, ask your question and join us? Uh, yes. Thank you. I don't know, my video is not coming up, but I'll just talk. Um, thank you. Those, those were two wonderful papers. Um, I was just wondering, uh, particularly for uh, Pavan in your research on Adha, um, I think a really interesting sort of case study or use case in terms of sort of this kind of question of compassionate surveillance uh, is the biometric surveillance or facial rec recognition surveillance, particularly of children. Um, obviously, sort of young children in particular, they're going through quite rapid uh, morphological changes in their face, uh, which makes sort of facial recognition uh, challenging. I know there's sort of research being done on, on that, um, I, think, uh, I think in India actually. But I'm, I was wondering how the sort of uh, biometric surveillance of children, uh, well, whether that came up, has come up as a, as a question in your research, or uh, if you've looked into sort of how that's uh, negotiated, that difficulty or managed by, by carers or, yeah, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts there. Thank you for your question, Christopher. Um, I'm not particularly sure about the facial recognition of children, but um, there's a scheme called Midday Meal Scheme, which provi provides uh, midday meals to school-going children in the rural parts of India and some semi-urban parts for poor families who can't afford uh, to feed their kids uh, lunch. So Midday Meal Scheme provides children with uh, you know, that service. Uh, there was a point during from 2000, between 2014 and 2018, when Aadhaar of children was being insisted upon that parents submit their kids Aadhaar uh, to be able to, to be able to continue availing of that service uh, for the kids in school. Uh, that was really problematic because uh, if parents couldn't submit Aadhaar, the kids would be excluded from uh, meals, being given meals by the school authorities. So that's one case that I'm aware of. And generally in India, the discourse on children's rights, uh, I'm not aware of the scholarship on, in that area particularly. But uh, just knowing anecdotally, uh, there's not much to say about children's rights. I mean, there's a lot of people working on it and they have a lot to say. But uh, socially, as pe how people treat children uh, and anything, any benefit that the government gives to any beneficiary who's poor or socioeconomically disadvantaged, you know, it's the whole you have to think about the relations of power at play in that transaction. There's an attitude of, you know, uh, you know, I'm doing you a favor kind of a thing to the, so the government is, uh, sorry, my ball hanging is falling off. Uh, the government is, the government has the right intentions, but the operators on the ground, when they, uh, you know, implement these schemes, uh, that's where the problem arises. So I don't know about facial recognition of children, uh, but children's rights uh, are not, they, it's not a, you know, there's not very much awareness of children's rights in India. It's, it's emerging now, mostly in urban contexts, but in rural contexts where children are often sent to work uh, at an early age to, you know, uh, earn, a living for the family, uh, it's very hard to say what agency they have. Uh, so that obviously requires, and there's research going on, I'm sure, uh, sociological research and anthropological research, which can answer that question. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, um, Pavan. And thank you all for joining us. I think uh, that's probably all we can uh, accommodate from this conversation. So I just want to start by or end by uh, thanking our, uh, both our panelists, uh, Raj and Pavan for excellent presentations and for the engagement in this really lively and fascinating conversation.
And I also like to thank um, the organizers of this panel, so Radhika Garur and uh, Leonard Hoon uh, from the Data Cultures uh, team at the Deakin Social Science Network. Thank you very much for organizing this panel and for bringing all of us together to think um, more deeply and interdisciplinary on how we can improve um, um, uh, biometrics and uh, in, in the context of uh, social and political um, recognition technologies. So thank you all very much. And I think um, uh, maybe Radhika would like to say a few words before we end the panel. Yes, um, thank you very much, Shiri. I wanted to thank um, Shiri yourself and, and Raj and, and Pawan for uh, a brilliant presentation today. Um, thank you for uh, you know, a discussion that was um, so important and, and so um, really necessary for our times, so topical. Um, this was a second in the series of four seminars, the Emerging Issues in Science and, the Science and Society seminars organized by the Science and Society Network. And um, you know, uh, uh, thanks from Data Cultures, which is the theme that organized this particular seminar. We, have, uh, we had a brilliant seminar this morning called the Anthropause. And uh, we have two more sessions coming up, not tomorrow, but the day after. Uh, one called Modeling COVID-19 and the other called Reframing Biocultural Collect uh, Collections. And um, we invite you to please uh, join us for those two sessions. Um, details will be in the same um, email that you, know, that you use to access this particular session. Um, thanks again. And final thanks for all the um, panelists and attendees and everyone that join us and listen and contribute to the conversation. I really hope that we'll have another opportunity to continue this engagement. Thank you everyone. And um, I think this just ends our panel. If anyone wants to um, stay online and ask a few more questions, um, I'm happy to stay for um, a bit of a Q&A.